Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of ED508. My name is Shay Kelly, and my philosopher, who I am an expert on, is John Paul Sartre. And today I'll be giving you a mini lecture, and then I'll finish it by reading an excerpt from an interview that is in one of his books. So, brief biographical information. Sartre was born in 1905 in Paris, France, and he died in 1980 in Paris, France. And Sartre is known as one of the foremost thinkers in the existentialist movement of the mid-20th century. He was influenced primarily by other French writers, many of whom were his personal friends. One is Gustave Flaubert, who is a novelist, and he's best known for literary realism. The second is Frantz Fanon, who is best known for his theories on anti-colonialism. And a third is Simone de Beauvoir, who was a part-time lover of his, actually, and she is known in the fields of existentialism, feminism, and social theory. Now, Sartre considered himself a writer first and a philosopher second, and he wrote in many forms. This includes novels, screenplays, stage plays, short stories, essays, books, and he also engaged in lectures. And his best known work is the essay Being and Nothingness, which was published in 1943. And Being and Nothingness is primarily concerned with free will. And the best way to sum it up is from some words taken from being and nothingness, and it's the phrase, existence precedes essence. So his life has been divided into three phases by his biographers, and these phases are firstly atheistic existentialism, then Marxism, and lastly anarchism. So I'll give brief overviews of those three phases. So the first is atheistic existentialism, and, quote, if God does not exist, there is at least one being whose existence comes before its essence, a being which exists before it can be defined by any conception of it. That being is man or the human reality, end quote. So Sartre believed that there is no human nature and our choices determine our destinies. And that goes back to the free will. And the second phase is Marxism. And Sartre advocated what you might call true Marxism, or Marxism in theory, and he warned against corrupt versions of the system and practice, such as what you see with Stalinist Russia and later iterations of Communist Russia, the USSR. And Sartre believed it was the duty of progressive Europeans to initiate true Marxist revolution, and he... Um, believe that one of the primary concerns of his time for progressive Europe was, quote, how to unite all the exploited to overthrow the old ossified structures of our own society, how to produce new structures which will ensure that the next revolution does not give birth to that sort of socialism, end quote. And by that sort of socialism, he meant the corrupted or bastardized versions that you see with Stalinist Russia and the Soviet Union. And the third phase, which is anarchism, primarily deals with his views on freedom and the subjectivity of man. So he thought that responsibility is the ultimate human freedom, and that our choices are, lead to us having to hold ourselves accountable for what results from those choices. So he thought that human beings are a subject acting upon the world, not objects in the world being acted upon. So the anarchy comes in, he thinks, the individual is in constant conflict with the interests of other individuals and with the interests of the power structure. So he has this kind of anarchical view where everybody is in conflict with the interests of either other individuals or with the interests of the state or whatever power structure you might apply. And I'll finish with his body of philosophy by sharing his views on knowledge and education. I'll begin with a quote 
quote, there is only intuitive knowledge, deduction, and discursive argument, incorrectly called examples of knowing, are only instruments which lead to intuition, end quote. So Sartre was skeptical of formal education, as you might believe, and he thought that formal education was simply an extension of the ruling class, that its sole, or its sole purpose, but its underlying purpose was to um, perpetuate the interests of the ruling class. He was also skeptical of intellectuals, which is somewhat ironic because you would probably consider him an intellectual. So he believed that intellectuals occupy an ineffectual space in society between working and ruling classes. So basically they're caught in this middle ground. They're bourgeois, but at the same time they're not part of the ruling class and they're too far removed from the working class. So they're stuck in this middle ground. And his primary, his primary contention with intellectuals is that they have one specific area of expertise, but at the same time, they kind of feel that they have carte blanche to critique things that are entirely outside of their experience. So I found that one of the most interesting things about Sartre is that he was very critical of intellectuals and academics, despite the fact that you would kind of put him in that fold uh, uh, professionally. So with that being said, I will finish the mini lecture by reading a passage from, uh, this is one of my primary sources that I use. So it's John Paul Sartre between existentialism and Marxism. And it's a collection of his works and includes a lot of lectures and interviews. So I'll be reading an interview that is called The Purposes of Writing, which was originally an interview given by Sartre to Madeline Chapsel in 1959. So it begins, the interviewer asks, who makes up your public? And Sartre replies, students, teachers, people who love reading, who have a weakness for it, they make up a very small circle. My print run is of no significance. It can be large or small, but this particular readership is still the same. Not my readership, but ours, that of everyone who is afflicted with the vice of writing. Journalists have an odd approach. They compile lists of circulations, calculate averages, and make statistical comparisons of dubious accuracy since they are generally based on incorrect data, and then draw conclusions. What they've done is confuse the meaning of the print run of a book with that of their own newspaper. In a country like the USSR, where there are state publishing ventures, the circulation of a book has a real meaning. If the public demands a new translation of Zola, this means that people really want to read or reread Zola. Whereas here, under conditions of liberal capitalism and free enterprise, circulation figures have no meaning. What relationship is there between a book like Schwartzbart's recent novel, a thoughtful, relentless, profound work, an attempt devoid of any illusions to recover all the dead we have killed, and the smartly dressed young woman with a hard, stupid face I saw the other day reading The Last of the Just in the dining car as she ate a pastry. She was reading his book, but she wasn't a part of his public. And the interviewer now asked, You haven't quite answered my question. Do you personally feel you have succeeded or failed? Would you say that anything has changed because of what you have written? So she's using a little... Socratic teaching here, and Sartre answers, not a thing. On the contrary, ever since my youth, I have experienced utter impotence. I'll pause for a moment. It kind of goes into his views on the ineffectual nature of the intellectual. So he goes on, that's neither here nor there. You could say, if you like, that to begin with, I wrote a few books which weren't directly concerned with social problems. They, then came the occupation. People began to think it was necessary to act. After the war, we felt once more that books, articles, etc. could be of use. In fact, they were of no use whatsoever. Then we came to feel, or at least I did, that books conceived and written without any specific relation to the immediate situation could be of long-term use. And then these turned out to be just as useless for the purpose of acting on people, all you found was a distortion of your own thoughts and feelings. 
you find your own words turned against you and changed out of all recognition by a young man taking a casual swipe at you. Fair enough, I did the same myself. That's literary endeavor for you. You can see that it doesn't produce the results you wanted it to. So that's it for the excerpt. I hope the presentation gave you a vague idea about what Sartre was about, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing your own presentations. Take care.